So first, yeah, thank you for the uh, invitation for the nice introduction. I hope I, I can live up to the expectation. So it's an, an honor to, to give a talk here. Can, can you see the slides now? Are they visible? Yes, all looks fine. Thank you, Michael. All looks fine, okay. Yeah, so um, I mean, I'm going to try to, yeah, to give my perspective on bridging the gap between academia and, and industry. And so the, the first part of the talk uh, is actually taken from an article we published as a group uh, last year at FMIX about the uh, entitled the first 25 years of industrial use of the B method, which we somehow quite optimistically used that, chose that title. So I'll, I'll give a bit of background about the history and, and then inspired by Jonathan, your work and also Anthony Halls and Hinchy's, uh, your various papers and very interesting papers on using formal methods. Uh, I've tried to come up with a few commandments and lessons uh, myself about how to, where, where we should go forward and uh, my experience in, in using formal methods in, in industry. So I mean here first about the, the history. So probably a, a lot of you can tell, know more about it than I do. So please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so, I mean, I guess all of you know what formal methods are. Uh, in case there's one or two in the audience who don't, so it's uh, yeah, he has one definition: mathematical techniques, right? To with the aim to produce provably correct software. Um, it is highly recommended in some of the development norms, like uh, Senelec norm EN fifty one to eight for the railway sector. Um, it has known benefits and yeah, known costs. Um, and I mean, one formal method, which I'm going to focus on today, although I, I'm going to mention others as well, is the, the B formal method. Um, and so the, the origins of actually date back quite a while. So it started in, in 1988 by, by Jean Raymond Abriel with a, uh, a system for the Paris uh, line A. And, and later um, in the first where, where the B method really appeared was the development of, of the Parisian Metro line 14, um, where at the time also the decision was made to industrialize the, the B tools. So supporting the B method by a company then called Digilog, which then was renamed to Steria and now bears the name ClearSea and which still markets the um, tool Atelier B, which can do code generation for B and proving and uh, so they are also going to be mentioned quite a bit today in that company. So they, they still do tool development in the formal methods area, but also uh, modeling. I mean, so you probably are aware of, of that system, which was ready by the end of 1998. Uh, I mean, uh, interesting fact is that the, the B model was larger than the generated ADA model, uh, which is probably also due to the fact that the B model, of course, had constructs required for the proof and re various refinement levels. And uh, I mean, if you look in the Siemens brochures, they have one issue where they discuss that system and say that it's still in version 1.0 and that not a single error has been found. So that's quite uh, a success story, right? And that was one of the documents that uh, Thierry Lecomte unearthed while writing this article for last year, uh, one of the early uh, documentations of the Atelier B tool dating 1995. Um, I mean, yeah, the B logical foundations, I mean, probably also most of you know those. I mean, here, here's my take on uh, what is important about the, the B foundations uh, from a logical point of view and maybe how they slightly differ to other state-based methods like Z. TLA plus alloy, VDM, abstract state machines. But I guess here one could do a whole talk or a series on talks about the, the subtle differences between all these uh, state-based methods. Right? Uh, so one thing for those familiar with Z, I mean, B is uh, rooted in arithmetic over integers only. So there's no, no reals. It has a distinction between mathematical integers and implementable integers. So the ones that you can actually uh, generate code for, uh, as you know, it's 
rooted in set theory. Um, compared to other tools like Allo, it allows higher order sets and functions. Uh, it has dropped quite a few things from Z to make it more easily amenable to tooling. Uh, I mean, a big issue where, I mean, Cliff Jones may uh, know much more about that than I do, is about well definedness, where there's a subtle differences between all these formal methods. Uh, TLA plus is untyped, uh, B has first order. Uh, type predicate logic at its heart and uh, with uh, well-defined as conditions and two-valued logic, whereas uh, VDM uses the logic of partial functions. I mean, what sets maybe be apart from the other state-based formal methods is that structuring, which was developed to allow to decompose a machine and to generate code for individual machines, which could be reused. And also with the aim of making proof obligations tractable. So that was certainly a success. And for instance, a, a formal method like TLA has hardly any structuring. And here in B, it plays an, an important role, the, the various machines uh, and how you can include them, use them, the various structuring mechanisms, which bear on the way you can prove things and how invariants are preserved. I mean, you probably all have seen something like that. So the idea in B at the time was when you have a, an abstract model, which is hopefully correct. And then by refinement, you add more and more detail until you arrive uh, at a level where you can generate code. And that was done, for instance, for the line 14. What is may maybe not so well known is that actually there are typically you use two code generators in, in in the industrial usage, because you, I mean, the code generation itself, you, you don't know, you cannot prove it correct. So usually you have two completely independent code generators running on two different hardware platforms. And, and that is, for instance, what was done in, in line 14. And the two hard, in hardware systems cross check each other. Okay, so I mean, that is one map I've received from, from ClearSea, which shows the, and it's probably not up to date anymore, all the railway installations uh, worldwide using the B method in, in some way. Um, so it, it's, I mean, one statistic is that 30% of the communication-based train control systems worldwide nowadays use the B method. And I mean, the most widely used system is probably the Wilbalis 400 from Alstom and which probably now has over 100 metro lines uh, worldwide uh, which operate, which are operated by that method and where the this part of the code is generated by uh, B. Okay, I mean, I'll, I mean, this is one citation of, obviously, I mean, this is from the person from Siemens where it says that it's not more expensive. Um, it's cheaper when considering the whole process. I mean, I, I, I seem to remember that Anthony Hall also has written something like that, but uh, that doesn't mean that people in industry actually believe these uh, statements. But it's interesting to have them. So, sorry, that all storm thing, is it the trains, right? It's just, it's being used in the trains, not in the lines or anything like that. It's in the trains that you are using the B method, right? I uh, mean, um, here there are various uses. Yeah, so on, uh, I mean, actually, the, I mean, it's being used in uh, for the zone control also for, yeah, what, what do you mean with the lines on board and uh, yeah you can you can have, you can you can you can control the lines the safety of the lines of the trains or you can have it inside the the train, the train yeah i think it's both it. yeah it's on board uh, i mean fernando michel at the time told me that i think most of the the alstone rolling stuff have, have be on board uh, even not the metro lines um and yeah, but th there's also trackside equipment that's being developed with B. So yeah, in, in the article, there's actually quite a lot of a list of other systems where software was developed using B. Okay. But it's definitely true. It's mainly it's railway, right? So that is actually one, of course, yeah, it's a success story, but a very limited one, right? Um, I mean, there were a few attempts of to move B outside of railways. There were some applications for uh, Peugeot for car systems and 
for helicopter overhead displays and so and uh, nuclear power plant. But I mean, it's definitely not not established in in those areas. Right? Uh, I mean, another way which has increased in the recent years is not to use B for software, right? So the classical way you try to derive a piece of code for a component, but to model an, an entire system, right? And not necessarily with the, the goal to um, generate code, but to understand the system. And um, I mean, there in B, we have the event B method, right? Which uh, I mean, from, from a terminology point of view, one talks about events rather than operations. Um, although they are very similar. Um, I mean, refinement is more liberal because now you don't have, in software, you have an API that you have to respect. When you do systems modeling, you can change your levels of abstraction and uh, change your point of view of how the messages look like, right? In, in the software system, once you say, this, this method takes three arguments, you cannot change it. Here you can, so you can, um, it has a more liberal refinement view. And again, I mean, the, the origins are actually also quite date back to 96. That's what we found the, uh, uh, the cover of, of this uh, proceedings where Jean-Raymond Abrial published the, the first paper on uh, extending B without changing it for developing distributed systems. Right. Um, I mean, the real foundations are described in, in his, the book on from 2010. Um, and it has simplified the B language. So there are quite a lot of subtle differences at the expression language and mainly at the substitution level. So statements have become much simpler, which allows proof obligations to become more tractable and in particular refinement is much more, much simpler. You don't have this double negation proof, of, uh, the proof obligation with the double negation inside. It's a much more constructive refinement proof. And uh, so the, the Rodan platform was developed within uh, several EU projects to support the, the event B method based on Eclipse. But what is maybe not so well known is that Atelier B also supports uh, an event B dialect right, um, using classical textual format. Right? Um, and they're not identical. So there are two really dialects of the event B method. So you, you, at the time there was an exporter, but I don't think it's working anymore. So it's really two different tools. But of course, I mean, uh, our, the tool we developed, the, the Pro B animation model checking tool, uh, it can read in both of them. Okay, so um, I mean, where was that used in industry? The, uh, the event B method, actually, it has been used by, by the company Clearsy using Atelier B to model a, a very large system. So the, uh, I mean, I would call that really a breakthrough. So they, they analyzed the New York City subway line seven, a, a communication based train control system by it, developed by Thales Toronto. Um, and they were tasked with performing, verifying the system, proving a safety case. And, um, and it took them quite a, I mean, a lot of time, right? But in the end, they had a, a formal proof. And actually it is a set of documents, a set of formal models, which together show that the, the system is correct and works uh, in a safe manner and uh, that a, various um, problems like co collisions or derailment or overspeeding were not possible, right? were, were safeguarded against. And um, so this was reused for another system uh, at Thales Toronto uh, in New York, uh, used in New York, and also for uh, various other systems like the Octis uh, system by in, in France by RATP. And, uh, and I think you know, clearly are continuing to use that approach for various other uh, railway systems to analyze the safety. Right. So I think that is really a nice breakthrough that a large industrial system could be formally analyzed. Right? Um, and 
I mean, another project that actually we did collaborate with ClearSea and Alstom on it was the, the zone controller of their uh, U400 system. I mean, that was published in RSSR 19. I mean, the software of that component was generated using classical B, but so there it was really about the, the requirements, ensuring that the requirements for that zone controller were correct. So I mean, there were quite a lot of subtle things that these zone controls have to take care of, especially I mean, they hand over trains from one zone to another. And there were quite a lot of things which were, which are not at all obvious how to handle. And um, again here, the good thing is that anal analysis is not easy, but once you have done the proof, you, you obtain key safety properties, which are then useful in the longer term to know how you can extend and adapt your, your system. Um, and another where we were involved in a system was the ETCS hybrid level three, where I'll talk about later as well. So there are uh, a new specification was proposed for a new train control system, which is between level two and level three. So it's not moving block. It's uh, a kind of mixed mode. Uh, I'll, I'll show, that, show that later. And there a formal model was useful to identify actually quite a lot of issues with the natural language specification, which have now been fixed. Uh, and here, what was interesting is that the model could be used in actually in real time for field tests. So I'll come back to that later as well. Okay, so I mean, that is done in, in systems modeling. So I think quite a lot has, has happened here. And that's one area where formal methods, I think, have gained traction, at least on, on the B side. Right? And another where we had success is uh, data validation. I mean, that's more of kind of a lower hanging fruit. Um, where mainly what proved to be an issue is that these safety critical systems, they once they're proven correct or either by proof or by you know, validated using tests, they also need to be configured. And uh, there a lot of things can go wrong and a lot of things can have to be respected. Um, and there it turned out that these properties on the configuration data on, on the actual runtime data could also be expressed quite conveniently in formal methods like B. Um, okay, so um, again, the idea what, what we've pursued and other companies like Sisterel have pursued is to the idea that you express your properties in, in B and then you can use uh, tools like, like, our, like ours, ProB or Ovado to check those properties on, on data. Um, I mean, what is different here compared to B for software is, I mean, expressivity is here even more of, a, more of an issue and you need to be able to express the, the properties conveniently. Uh, you need to be able to have things like string manipulation functions, maybe regular expression matching, or you need to be able to handle large data, large values, and tool certification here is also uh, an important issue. Okay, so I mean here, so there are quite a lot of mainly railway applications uh, where both trackside and onboard and uh, which you can also find in the paper uh, where data validation has proven to be very useful. And I mean, if you look closely, you see there, there are quite a lot of custom tools that have been developed for various customers, various lines, which then automatically check the data, flag errors and produce validation report. Okay, so um, I mean, again, more can be found in, in that paper where we also analyzed common success and fail factors. Uh, and here my dog is barking. I mean, that's maybe a good point, uh, maybe to briefly stop. Are there any questions on, on that history part, right? So in summary, what has happened in B is the software development, the early part. So that was mainly before I entered the, the B method. Then in recent years, the, the system modeling was quite a lot of 
sometimes quite impressive, I find applications for to large systems uh, and B for, for data validation. Um, can I just ask a question? It might not be appropriate. Yeah. How does this integrate with the IEC, um, uh, uh, the, the standards for, um, for developing safety critical embedded software? So where, where, how does it I mean, for... have a safety, uh, a safety life cycle alongside the life cycle? Um, uh, that, 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 in, that in, does include systems as well as software though. So I just wondered about that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, with the development norm, I'm familiar with the EN5128, for and instance. That's probably the one, is it? Um, I mean, there, for instance, what, what we were focused on were uh, if you are to use a, a tool for, for data validation, it's classified as a tool of class T2, for instance. So that was relevant for, for us. So you have T1, T2, T3. T3 is a tool that is uh, where a tool can introduce new errors. That's, for instance, if you have a code generator or, or a compiler. No, no, it, and and it here, the, this data validation is just a tool that checks. So it's class two, but you still need to do quite a lot of checking. No, I, I, I don't think it was quite that. It was, it was a standard developed um, in the end of the end of the 80s and early 90s. And it mm -hmm. got a generic uh, set of standards where they introduced the concept of a, of a safety life cycle model okay, alongside. Yeah. And then, then they have um, specialized versions of this in various parts of the industry. So they might have one for transportation, and et cetera. Yeah, Never I'm mind. not sure exactly Sorry. we're talking about the same thing. I mean, this EN5128 is a specialized one of a, a generic one, so yes. There's a generic um, one, and then yes. there's development ones. I mean, you have the 2662 for the automotive. That's it, then yes. You have the DO178. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's the one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, so yes, we're following that, that one. Yes. So, I mean, but yeah. I'm mainly familiar with the railway one, right? Uh, this is a railway one. Yeah. I see what you mean. Yes. Yeah. 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 And, and here we were concerned, I mean, data validation, we were concerned with certifying the tool. Yes. Uh, and obviously, it also applies, I mean, to, to the B for software development. Yeah. Um, I mean, for the systems modeling, I don't know exactly what the norm says about, I'd have to look up about modeling. Yeah. Okay. Um, but so, yeah, Andrew, I don't know whether I've uh, given you. Yes, sorry. Yes, that's fine. Yes. Yeah, I think I've got the gist. And, and, yeah. and, and Andrew Martin wanted to have a. a oh, sorry. A catch up about what <laughs> happened in the last years. I hope maybe it wasn't too fast. No, um, that's, that's really instructive. Thank you. And, and impressive, I think. Yeah, a lot going on. I mean, a lot has been going on, but of course, yeah, these are the success stories. And yeah, I mean, compared to other things, like when you compare to where Python is being used or other languages, okay, it's still a small niche, but it's better than, than nothing. It's, yeah. Um, okay. And uh, okay, so now let's go to, to part two. Um, so, and there I've been inspired, obviously, by articles by Jonathan Bowen and uh, Michael Hinchy and also Anthony Hall. Um, so I'll try to do, distill a few uh, nuggets or a few lessons in, into to commandments here. Um, first based on modeling and then a few, if we have time on developing tools for formal methods. Right? Um, and so one thing, one commandment is that thou shalt animate your models, right? Um, so I think it is important. I mean, it uh, ensures that your assumptions are so the model is consistent, right? If you have an inconsistency, at least in the B model, quite often in, in the prover, you don't catch it. Right? If you have, if your axioms are inconsistent, the, the prover is happy. And, um, but the animation will catch that. So the animator tries to start up and find constants which satisfy the axioms and tries to find actually a, a model. And also, I mean, it, it, uh, will, it spots errors you haven't thought of yet, right? So sometimes, uh, and that was one quote by Christophe Metier from Sisterel at the, at the time that was in the deploy project. 
he said that, that every formal model proven out which has not been animated contained errors. So that was his experience. And it's also mine. Right? Um, and I mean, at the time also, we there was one uh, example I gave. Oh, sorry. Oops. Uh, it's too quick. Here, that's one example. It was a uh, parsing model of the parsing algorithm done by Jean Raymond, where everything was proven, but it had one inconsistency in, in the axiom, right? And after animation, it was found. And I mean, obviously, he, he fixed it afterwards, but it, uh, so it's my, the message here if everything is green in the prover, I mean, you probably know that that doesn't mean you're done. Right? And, um, and also another thing is that, I mean, animation is not enough. So I'll try to show that in a moment. But I also think it's quite often important to visualize what I mean is provide a graphical representation. So not just a, a blank slide, but something more. Um, here's maybe one example from a concrete visualization of, of one of our the models for uh, in, in industrial models. In the top, you have the, the textual representation. And uh, at the bottom, you have two visualizations. And, and I think for a human, it's not the obvious to know which one, which corresponds to which one, right? Um, and even I have to look, and I think it's the left one. But so quite a lot of things you, which are obvious in the graphical representation, like here, train overlapping different zones, you don't see in, in the this textual or in the representation of, of the state. So I think it's important to also help you as a modeler or domain experts, people who are not able to, to read the, the formal notation to inspect your model. And I mean, I have actually prepared a, a small demo using uh, a new version of our tool and a new UI, uh, which, uh, so you're going to see that in action. So in that tool, I'm going to uh, open a model uh, and we can play with the model. We have uh, the animator shows us which operations are, are feasible. We can inspect the state in, in the middle. Uh, you can see the history and uh, I'll show you the importance of, of visualization. Um, okay, so I mean, what I'm going to show you here is a, a small train model, a very simple one. Uh, so it models uh, just a linear track topology. So, uh, and we have, it's a finite piece of railway track. Uh, it has a finite number of positions starting at zero until a maximum call, uh, constant track element number. That track is divided into so-called track site train detection zones. Uh, so uh, which are zones where the system can know whether a train is in it or not typically implemented by track circuits or axle counters, which know how many axles have entered and left the zone and know when it, the zone is free. Then trains have just positions, a rear end and a front end. So implicitly the train covers all positions between the rear and the front. And then some trains have a, a movement authority. So they uh, are have the permission to move on uh, and so what we model is just model this model simple movement and I mean it's a very simple model it doesn't cover delays uh, um, and typically these track to site train detection zones will have delays uh, that typically there will be position reports uh, and so on so all that is um, ignored so here you see that model i mean i, I haven't had time now to, to send that to to a prover uh, so that's how the model looks in classical B. So not not uh, in Rodan in using the Atelier B syntax mainly. Uh, and what you have here is a few constants defining the the track. You have properties on these constants stipulating that the the zones are disjoint and cover the entire track. And then we have, uh, as I said, these variables: train rear end, front end, which describe the train positions. And we have occupied a set of train trackside train detections which are occupied and the train MA movement authorities, which is a partial function from trains to track position. And then here there are a few invariants. 
for instance, there's a, a safety invariant that um, trains should not, position should not intersect, there's no collision. Um, trains should not be empty and uh, trains should respect their MA. That's one assumption that trains will not move beyond the, their movement authority. So here we have a, the verifications view. So I've run the, can here run the model checker here, it's happy. And uh, so the question is, is the system correct? And uh, I mean, let's, I can load it. We can set up constants, initialize it. And no, it's, you see, we, we deadlock straight away. So the model checker was happy here. didn't find any invariant violation, but as you here see in animation, um, I mean, I haven't explained the operations uh, yet, but you cannot execute any of them. So there's one operation train accepts first MA. So that's typically when a train starts up, the first time is uh, quite often special. It receives a, uh, it's located and, and, and here receives a, a first movement authority. And then here, a new movement authority is to extend an ex existing one. Um, and then here you see, this is an, an operation which has a guard which stipulates that the um, well, new MA is beyond the front end. And then here it says that uh, it shouldn't intersect any uh, reserved areas for other trains. So reserved areas I've defined below it, it's basically uh, their position to joined with the movement authority. And uh, I mean, does anybody see what's wrong here? Why can I not execute that? So, I mean, if you have a look at the, the state view, we can see we've initialized train one with rear end zero and front end two. Train two goes from five to six. Um, two track side detection are occupied. Um, And it's actually an error I did when writing this model for the demo. Um, and so you see here, um, it says a train accepts first MA. So it's a train that doesn't have a, an MA yet. The new MA must be on the track. It must be beyond the front end. So here, this is just something that I've done to restrict the number of choices that normally one would do in a, in a refinement. This is for, for the demo. Uh, so I've, I only allow multiples of five for the movement authority. So every five positions. And I mean, if you don't know, you can look in the animator and you can expand the operations. And for instance, look at why, why is the, the first MA not uh, possible. And you see here, uh, what is red is the, this condition that an MA must be safe. And uh, I mean, if you look closely, you can see here, uh, the new MA is not allowed to intersect with the, the new reserved area with the train itself. So there's TR1, TR1 here. Um, and the error I did here was that I forgot to stipulate that T2 is different from the train for which we are going to try to give the first MA. Okay, so I'm going to save. So now if we uh, initialize, now you see things work. So a train in the animator, we can have a, a look what happens. Uh, we can give the train an MA. You see it has changed here. We can move forward. We can give the first train a movement authority. It can move, trains can move. Um, everything seems to work, right? Uh, if we do model checking, um, also there's no, there's no error. And now we're happy. And now we come to the, the next commandment, of course, I mean, you should visualize, right? Um, and so that, that you can do here. Um, I, I'll open the, the visualization here. Um, actually, oops. So now I've initialized. So here you actually can now see 
the, the chain positions. Uh, I'll expand it here. Um, so here we can give the train an MA and you, it's now been visualized. And I can click here actually to make the train move. And maybe you can see I mean, what's going on here. Uh, and the train is grown, right? the, that's not good. Uh, then you can see here the, the trackside train detection hasn't re detect, re reacted directly, but only at the next step. So there's something wrong there. And also if you um, give a train an MA, you see it, it cannot move until the, the end of its movement authority. So all those things I, I would argue you wouldn't have, um, very difficult to spot just looking at the, the textual representation or even while reviewing your, your model, even on, on such a simple model, right? And I mean, the errors are here, right? So one was using a, a less than instead of a of less than equal. Uh, another is problem is here that when updating the train, the trackside train detection, I use the old state. Um, and uh, another problem is that I, the, the train length, I, I used an old piece of code. Um, and which made the, the train grow. If now, if I correct those mistakes, then I can uh, now, for instance, try and see that things work as they should. Um, sorry. So you can now see that, for instance, the trackside detection works straight away. Trains can move to the end of their movement authority. Everything seems to work. Okay, so that was a very small demo of visualization. I hope I've convinced you. So definitely it has helped me analyze model quite when I receive models to review something I don't understand what I've done, but I usually do is I actually create a, an animation and a visualization. And I mean, I've done that for, and since I was tasked by a company to inspect uh, formal models that were developed for one of their systems. Uh, and by doing that, by doing the animation and uh, the visualization, actually I did identify quite a few issues. Right? And, and that was a system that was fully proven. Um, and that was actually a slide I presented to, to that company. Um, and so I think it, it is useful. It's something that provides added value and at least helps me quite a bit. Um, so here I might adapt a sentence that uh, from Leslie Lampard. I mean, he says that uh, that formal mathematics is nature's, nature's way of letting you know how, <coughs> how sloppy your mathematics is. And uh, I, mean, I would say, well, my experience is that animation visualization is nature's way of letting you know how sloppy your formal mathematics is. Um, but of course, I mean, you need all of that. So I'm not saying only use animation because of course, then you will also make mistakes, right? Then you can go full circle. So that's the, the next commandment is of course, not to abandon the traditional form of proof methods, right? Uh, so in my experience, all three work very well together. Um, I mean, I find proof is important to solve the state explosion problem to help scale. Um, and it provides insights, which the other techniques do not necessarily provide insights. They provide insights on how, no, on, on why a system is correct. Right? Um, I mean, model checking is very useful, can check liveness properties, and but usually in for more complex systems, it's very, very difficult to, to have it to scale, scale it to, to larger systems. I mean, for interlockings, there is quite a lot of work that where you can 
without proof, with just, let's say, SAT-based uh, tools, you, you can exhaustively check uh, an interlocking for correctness. But for, for other systems, uh, currently, it cannot be done. Yeah? And then animation visualization uh, is very useful for validation and detects inconsistencies and also surprising obvious errors, right? I mean, like the fact that the train was growing is something you wouldn't have thought of probably before that there's a property that the train uh, or something like that it sometimes arises where you actually you didn't think uh, about those properties. I mean, what is difficult is that these uh, proof and animation uh, and model checking have conflict, conflicting needs, right? So quite often adding a, a property to your axioms makes the prover happy, but then makes the model checker or the animator sad, right? If you say something like for all subsets of a very large set property S holds, then you know, the, the prover is happy to just instantiate that for one in, in a proof as needed. and. Um, Usually that is done interactively anyway, so it, it helps the proof, but it makes uh, finding models that much harder. And on the other hand, if you when you provide concrete data, constructive definitions, that makes the animation model checking tools happy, uh, but then restricts the, the usefulness of your proof or also, yeah, sometimes leads the provers astray. All right, so I mean, that's something where, yeah, I, I don't think we have really solved that yet. So quite often what I do is you use refinement to have create model checking animation instances of a very generic proof model. Uh, and for those properties that uh, are problematic for the other tools, uh, I use for instance, pragmas to mark them ignore. So they won't be directly used by the solver. You can inspect them if you want, there's a warning that not, not all axioms have been checked, but you can at least uh, find a model and, and run your visualization. Okay. Um, I think Jonathan, that was one also, there was one commandment about reuse. And um, in, in the original 10 commandments for formal methods. And my experience here has been to Reusing models is difficult, right? Uh, I mean, you, models for other developments, right? Um, but I think what, what has been successful is to reuse ide ideas, right? So quite often when you model one railway system, you, you know how to do the inductive proof, what kind of properties are important, what kind of specifications lead to, are amenable to verifications, and uh, that you can, can reuse. So I think that's my experience, at least we, I, we've done that, is to reuse key concepts from one system to another, but typically we start completely from scratch while, while modeling. Next one is, I, th I think that's also the technology has enabled us to make much better use of formal models, right? So um, what you can do is use the formal model once you have, especially once you have visualization to give domain experts an interactive way to query the, the, the specification, right? And that's what we did for hybrid level three, where domain experts were able to play with a, an interactive visualization on a, on a sample track and, and understand the various concepts of the the hybrid level three uh, specification. Also something we've added quite recently to, um, to our tool is that you can export traces with visualizations as an HTML file. So for instance, you can uh, save a trace and then email it like here to this person and say, can you have a look at it? And then uh, that person can open that trace and in, in any browser and, and look at it. So I've actually, I have saved one of the traces that we played here, or actually two, um, and I've opened them here in the browser. So first is the, the buggy one, right? So here's the, it's just plain one HTML file. 
and you can step through the trace and you can run through it in one go. And then here, for instance, the domain expert can then see, oh, this is not a, supposed to happen. Uh, train has become bigger and the uh, trackside train detection was not triggered straight away and, and so on. Right? And here's an, an export of the, the other, the corrected one, where, where you run through, everything looks fine. You can play it also slowly. You can uh, add, inspect information. And I think that can be a useful tool to communicate with uh, domain experts and people can have a look at the, the variable value. So all that has been saved into to one file. Um, Okay. Um, another thing one can use is uh, notebooks. So a student of mine has developed a, uh, an extension for Jupyter where we can use B uh, inside the, the, the notebook. So that, that means you can mix a markdown, text, graphics uh, with snippets of formal code. And uh, it's, it's also, I think, something that can lead to executable documentation. And so we haven't used that yet. I mean, I've used that for teaching, but not yet really in uh, for industrial models. So maybe <clears throat> there are still one or two features missing. For instance, the, these visualizations uh, generated uh, by this VisB uh, tool, which you saw at the moment, you cannot yet integrate them in the notebooks. And I think that's important. And compared to the HTML export here, you can add comments and uh, so my, my dream would be have an egg, a specification document where you can um, we can execute query uh, and interactively ask questions about your your spec okay so um, another new way of using formal models I think is executions. So actually to not just use it for documentation, but for testing. So I think that is something that Jonathan is already in one of your commandments papers is to use, you can use formal models to derive tests. Um, and we've actually, we've also used them in a, in a test environment as an Oracle for a system which you didn't have available. But in the hybrid level three, we went even further and uh, actually managed to run a formal model in real time for field tests. And I mean, the, the first, so that was one usage by Alstom in a, in a, as a test oracle. But what I want to focus here on is the, this hybrid level three application. So the, the story was that uh, there was in 2017, in December, it was scheduled to have a, a trackside test where to check whether these new principles could work in practice. Uh, and uh, Thales actually did have, didn't really have sufficient time to develop uh, an implementation, but there was sufficient time to model, write a, a formal model, and we've used it as a, a prototype. Uh, and so, that was turned out to be quite successful. So we had a, a formal model, which we used to actually find quite a lot of issues in the natural language specification. And later we were able to run it in, in real time. And I mean, the good thing is that the, the log of the formal model, for instance, could then be replayed and used step-by-step step to analyze the issues. Um, in here on the right, you can see it uh, running in England and somebody pointing at the visualization of, of the formal model to see what's happening. And uh, so if you're interested, uh, there are quite a few articles uh, uh, about various case studies uh, done on that uh, hybrid level three specification. Um, and so other people also modeled it in, in Roan, in Event B, in uh, uh, Alloy, and in, in other languages. 
Here's one article, a technical article uh, about it. And there's a video on YouTube if you want to see the, the formal model in action with real trains. So that was done a year after for the Deutsche Bahn, for the Innotrans fair, trade fair to show that these principles could work in practice. So if you look at the video, you can see here in the middle, what you see is actually the, the formal model being executed and visualized. Uh, okay, so I think I'm running almost out of time. Uh, and I could stop here, whether there are any questions on the commandments on the modeling. I mean, I have a, a few smaller commandments on tools coming up. I, I did have a question, uh, Michael. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I was really enjoyed that because it, you know, it, it's you seem to be making a lot of progress on all sorts of uh, all sorts of problems, which which I know people you know, we've certainly encountered in practice, and I absolutely, you know, my top priority would have been you know for for, for the inclusion of of animators and and, and simulators uh, uh, connected to formal models, but I was puzzled by one thing you said about them, um, which is that they were necessary uh, to find inconsistencies in the axioms um, mm. because uh, I would have expected that like said that the you know uh, almost your first mm. proof obligation is that the that there is a, there is an in, there is a model for the state okay yes yeah, so obviously yeah yeah sorry so maybe I, I misrepresented yeah, that so you're right even the the B method does have such a proof obligation but it's not implemented in the Rodan tool and oh, it's okay. not implemented <laughs> in, in RTDB and so that right. means that if you in in the tooling, you you don't get a, any feedback, right? Right. Okay. Uh, so that's it's a tool limitation, not an. It's a tool. Yeah, yeah. You're right. So it. it yeah. Okay. That's a, fine. I understand that. Thank you. Yeah. And also the limitation. It's because it's very difficult to to prove existential quantifiers, right? And um, this is, of course, absolutely at the heart of our problems, isn't it? Yes. Uh, I mean, I've, I have. I have. I said, what would have been, I, 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 any set, based, set theory based method come, hits this problem, I think. I think that's, that, that's really the bottom line, isn't it? Yeah, and, and that's exactly what the animator has to do. So, and, but I agree, I mean, when you could just use that bit of the animation, I mean, the, just use a constraint solver to ask the question, is there a, a model for my axiom? Um, another thing I, I have proposed, which would, would actually be very simple to implement is a kind of a canary, right? Something that adds <laughs> one, one equals two at the end. And then if, if that becomes green, you say, no, oops, or something. <laughs> so, I mean, you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't catch everything, but it would have caught maybe a few of these issues. Yes, yes. Um, Michael, I had a question. I was surprised by your mandament there of uh, not reusing models because models are so expensive to produce. And I think one of the barriers that I, 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 I see from coming from industry is that a lot of people want to go yeah. straight to code, it's straight to, to hardware, and they, they're not, they, they don't necessarily see the value of models. And so it is kind of a fight uh, to get them to write models, a lot of work. Um, certainly around my group and, and so on, yeah. try and help in the automatic generation of models from more palatable languages for users and so on. But can you comment why you think that models should not be reused? Yeah, I mean, of course, I, I'm yeah, maybe exaggerated my point. And you, you're right, probably for if you want to use B or another thing for software, you probably do want to reuse. Uh, machines, I mean, but for system modeling, my experience is that it's usually it's difficult to reuse because I mean you really need to understand the components, and quite often then it's better to redevelop them from scratch or to use another one as guideline. But I mean to to, to be able to reuse a component one to one, it's very rare. I mean we have reused some things, but that was staying from in the in the same uh, company, right? From uh, and then there's probably a model of a, of a similar system or, but if it's two different systems by different, developed by different companies, my experience was it's very difficult to, to reuse and, um, 
and especially yeah for systems modeling right maybe not for software modeling yeah. you have a question for margaret i believe uh, hello um i wonder you 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 devoted the whole um of your talk and it's been very interesting on train systems i just wondered if you knew are uh, other people working on other on other um in other areas um i, w I wondered why is it particularly useful be for, for for train systems or is it an accident or or what for example industrial systems uh, is nobody using them for industrial systems or any other systems and good point train uh, systems i mean i think for for railway b is a, a sweet spot because it's I mean, it has a very rich notation for relations and it has transitive closure and a lot of uh, relational yeah. image operators which are very useful on rail topologies right yes so it's very easy to reason about which track sections are reachable and so on yes. and updating train images and and for that it, it's very convenient and probably less convenient in aviation where you probably need more yeah where you also need reels or yeah in, in railway it's quite an integer oriented domain that's why b works well i mean if you want to use move to you know let's say aviation or maybe even cars you probably need something like reels or uh, probably yes. need to add them back to to b from z yes. again or, yeah. yes i see that yes and um i mean i think industrial systems yeah i i think probably for for plants controlling plants it should also be so I mean, but there may be other yeah, tools would also work. I mean, I think really B is the sweet spot is railways and yeah. But I mean, yeah. I and mean, I know it's been used by Clearsy also. They had projects on uh, nuclear power plants. Yeah. They had also modeling automotive systems or the, the electric signaling and so on. Um, yeah. But then maybe for yeah, power plant, some other propositional logic or sub based would can is possibly sufficient. I mean, for instance, for interlocking in railways, quite often I mean there are tools that just are used based on propositional logic, which are very successful. Um, uh, Michael, may may I ask how much do you think this is due to to history and to oh. the fact that you've already pointed out? That it's very difficult to copy models from one domain to another. Um, I mean, I, I, obviously, B was developed um, in the railway area, um, and, and you know, however good it was for other areas, um, one suspects that uh, you know the, the people are unwilling to, to to make what seems to be a very big leap into an unfamiliar uh, into an unfamiliar notation. Whereas if you work in railways, everybody knows that B works for railways. And so you're more willing to, to to take the risk of trying it. Do you think that's a factor? I think that that is a factor. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, even in railways, there are quite a, there are managers who say no, they don't want to hear about formal. Oh, methods. sure. Yes, I understand that. Yes, tell, <laughs> tell me about it. <laughs> but there are are a few who are interested, and and I think yeah, have become more interested in recent years. Was my feeling. Um, well, that's good, big, certainly. Because yeah, certification costs have increased, test costs have increased, and yeah, uh, but I agree. In other areas, it's even more difficult to convince people, and I think you have to really promise or quite a lot of benefits. <laughs> yes, twenty percent is not enough, or fifty. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sorry, relating to that previous question about the existential proof, uh, wouldn't the initialization provide an easy way out to discharge the proof because the initialization gives you a state gives you an instance of the mod model. So it shouldn't be too hard to prove that because you've got everything in the initialization. So it, sh it shouldn't be too hard to prove. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for the constants, if, if Proby does find um, a model, then you know the, the axioms are uh, not contradictory. I mean, the initialization, I mean, in principle, you have, actually have to prove, I think, that the initialization is possible for all. Uh, valid very, uh, instances of your constants. So I think that is not obvious. So it's not a simple existential quantifier. I mean, it's you have 
quantify an existential quantify depending on other values, right? So you have to prove that for all values of your constants, you must be able to initialize the machine. But doesn't initialization provide a value, or at least in a machine gives you an the initial value of the variables, and therefore, uh... yeah. I mean, I, of course, also if the, if the initialization is a provides you concrete values, I mean, it doesn't have to. So in B, you can say, just give me any initial value which satisfies the invariance. Um, so some models just do that. Right? Okay, but if you have those values, then it's trivial, right? If, if, if you provide, which, which, yeah. which happens in many cases, right? In many cases, you are providing the values for yes. an initialization. You are saying that the sequence is- Yeah, I mean, but for instance, one, one thing in the, in the railway, Domain, for instance, you have properties about train movements quite often, right? You have, say, what happens when a train moves, how fast it can move, um, where it can move to. So that these are properties that allow you later to prove things about train movement. And there it's easy to make mistakes. Right? And uh, actually there the, the model is actually in not just where the, are the tra trains standing, but how do train positions evolve? So it's actually a physical function about how trains react to breaking commands and how, how they move. And, and there it's easy to, so in those cases, actually, it's not just finding where the trains stand and, and so on. It's actually quite a lot of complex higher order functions that need to be valued for a model. Um, it's yeah. Mike, could I, could I ask you one question? I, I really like the, the animation thing, particularly when you could uh, send a file for the whatever stakeholder is 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 appreciating what you've achieved. Um, but then, if um, like the train growing, uh, which struck me visually when I was like, "Oh, what's going on there?" Um, does they do, do they get to you and say, "Oh, we haven't thought about that," or would they say to you, "Oh, didn't you say you're going to formalize, and now visualization will solve the the formal maths problem? Why didn't you?" You, you, you'll pick that earlier. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. And like, uh, it's not complete in the end. Yeah. I mean, of course, the train growing I did for this demo, right? This this didn't happen in one of the earlier real models, right? No, yeah. sure. But do you see what I mean? In the sense yes. that when the formal model is not complete and then suddenly you get an error and then, then yeah. well. Yeah, I mean, what, what happened there, for instance, for the hybrid level three is that, I mean, you have these different zones can be in four different states, ambiguous, uh, unknown, free, occupied. And then quite often what would happen is something unexpected would happen. Yeah, why is this zone not free, right? And then, uh, I mean, the domain expert can see, you know, no, it should be, this zone should be marked as free or should be marked as, uh, as unknown. And then you can expect, um, so, so I think that it was useful. They weren't, please, these people then, uh, Say querying the value of my of the modeling, right? So <laughs> quite often, yeah. I'm I'm not sure where exactly where, where you know whether I've answered your question. No, uh, yes, you have. I guess I've had mixed experiences of that, where people said things like, "Oh, I see. We haven't thought about that. Great." Yeah, yeah. But also, the the very skeptical ones said things like, "Oh well, didn't you say you're going to find them? Uh, why haven't you?" And then you go like, oh, well, because I didn't know about this. And well, you were the stakeholder who didn't yeah. tell me. Quite often, see the other way around. In the, you, you have some sets of documents, you model them, and then you realize, yeah, look, you, you've, you have forgotten that case. This can happen. Exactly. Or well, this can happen. So, uh, so I did, didn't, uh, yeah, a good point. But I, I don't think, maybe I didn't realize, but that they would question the modeling. But the, I mean, there, I think, I mean, unless it's really small details which they're not interested in, but quite often, I guess, at least for hybrid level three, it was valuable. I it's guess the trouble is, this happened in a medical device environment, and the trouble is, you've already invested a lot of money in the certification process. If it's certified now, and you found an error, and then, then, well, you can't afford to do the clinical trial again. Yeah. Um, whereas in the in the train case, you say, "Oh, I'll stop the trains and well, put another train." In the medical device case, you don't have another one to put in, and then um, it creates a, a a curious social technical tension. That was in my experience. Um, yeah. 
I mean, I've had the tension one or once or twice where the people that didn't actually really want to know about the error, the issues found. Yeah, that's <laughs> that can be true. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I don't want to know, true. otherwise I have to report it or write it down. Or <laughs> yeah, so there, there can be that tension, right? That you create work <laughs> for them which they don't want to do. <laughs> they have to file a, an internal report about a fault or something. And, the medics are very happy to know about this, but the engineers doing the medical device are not. Yeah, <laughs> but they're all in the same room, and then you kind of uh, have a uh, an interesting conversation. Let's see. Okay. Any more questions? We we seem to have moved on to questions. But I don't know if there's anything else you want to say to wrap up, Michael. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so should I write up? I mean, for tools, I've, yeah, I mean, there's one commandment thou shalt use an appropriate notation programming language for your tool, but maybe I should use and do another talk about some, yeah. somewhere else about uh, what you have to do to write a tool for formal methods, right? Um, yeah. I'm sure that could take a whole talk, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, one thing, maybe a quick anecdote. So, one thing, uh, is for instance, I mean, I, you've, the heart of Proby is written in Prolog, and I think it's a very nice language, of course. And um, I mean, one thing is, for instance, Hindley Milner type inference is really for B or Z like language is really that piece of code here, right? It's, uh, and of course, if you add, you would have to add rules for more operators, but basically you have predicates, uh, binary predicates, equality greater than, and so on. But it's really very simple. So the inference rules are one to one to prolog. And so actually last week uh, we had I had the case we have an experimental parser written in Java, which also encodes that in Java. And for a larger piece of uh, B spec, it was taking 57 seconds to do the type checking. We haven't had it analyzed why it's so slow, but the equivalent uh, the prolog code is 0 0.125 seconds for that. Time. So um, goes to show at least use the right language for the right tool. And in, I think for the heart of Proby Prolog was a good choice. And we use Java for a lot of other things. And uh, yeah, um, and that is that. And uh, another thing exactly here, I've already summarized these commandments. Um, could have discussions with Cliff Jones about the development of Rodent and, and the uh, use of text and command line interfaces. and. Um, also, one thing you shall think twice before redeveloping your tool from scratch. So the the UI you saw in action actually took quite a lot of time. So we decided we were going to do a new uh, Java API and a new UI, and it really took a, a long time until it caught up with the the features of the old one. And so that's something. Developing a tool from scratch is you really think twice before doing it. And one thing I also I think is important is to try and obtain user feedback, make it easy for people to file bug reports. I mean, they do you a favor, and it's you should make it, their life as easy as possible. Okay, so um, I think I hear these. I've reached ten commandments, so we can stop. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, yeah, maybe just one, two, one thing. So uh, new projects are currently on, on this aspect of validation. We have a collaboration with the University of Linz where we're uh, trying to improve all this validation process. So where we actually want to do something called validation obligations that just like proof obligations help you to structure the validation and tell you what you've done, what haven't done, do automated trace replace. And if you're interested, if you have case studies, we're interested in them, right? If you have something where you think, okay, we, uh, that could be useful. Um, and another is we've just started a project also with Thales Germany and a few other smaller companies about certifying railway system with AI. So that is quite a challenge. And at the moment, you know, it's strongly discouraged from the development norms of using uh, AI in SIL3 and SIL4 systems. So I don't know. So there we are. We're going to have a look at it from a certification perspective. What are the, the options? What you can, what can you do if you want to embed maybe even a little bit of AI in your train system? Okay, so I mean that's basically it. So I think the formal methods in general B in particular can be used for 
I think, three interesting areas of applications in the classical generation for code, modeling of systems, uh, which can be railway systems or algorithms, where, for instance, the TLA plus language has been quite successful uh, at Amazon for example, to, to model complex algorithms, then configuration of components and data. And I think tooling has made a lot of progress in the last years. Right? So tools can help errors that I think no human could ever find. Um, and I think visualization can really help you understand complex system. And I think there is still a lot of that can be done. Right? Maybe together with clever AI techniques, maybe one can really do much more and help a, a human grasp the, the intricacies of, of a complex system. Um, and find bugs and fix them. Okay, thank you. Right, well, thank, thank you very much, Michael. I'll give you, anyone who wants to give a little clap <laughs> in any way you like, like waving, etc. please do. We, we still have one or two extra uh, questions. Uh, uh, Margaret, have you got a question? You've got your hand I'll, up. I'll just keep butting in. I just wondered if you might not know this, of course, uh, one area of application might be, particularly at the moment, uh, defense systems. Yeah. Do you, I mean, you might not necessarily know whether... Yeah. I, mean, <clears throat> I mean, I know that we, we did in with uh, the University of Southampton at the time put in a proposal where there was also you know, drone applications. You know, yes. In civil drones there. Right? Yeah. I mean, you, you think about drones or... Yeah. Well, uh, any... Or, um, yeah defense application really drones would be a particularly important one yeah. apparently everything oh we're not going to have any soldiers anymore i'm just yeah. joking of course yeah. everything <laughs> by ai in the future we've, we've got a very big aircraft carrier which you need to do something with <laughs> <laughs> and awe did use uh, formal methods right they, they they even had what was it uh, a b specification of a, a processor i don't know what what's come of it. Maybe some of you know whether that has ever made it into production. And, and I know that they are quite interested. At least they were at the time while I was still in, in the UK. Yeah. Yes, I, I did look up the uh, the seven deadly sins, Michael. <laughs> so I put it in the chat for you. I th ah, think okay, you have to have you, access to IEEE to get hold of it. But <laughs> ah. I don't think there's anything that that's exciting in it, but if you're collecting <laughs> such papers, there's there's one more for you. Uh, great, yeah, good. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Yeah. yeah. And I am, yeah. Margaret, you mean you did develop a Z animator at the time, right? And yes. Uh, Sorry, is yeah. that me to me? Yes, yeah, that's to you. Yes, yes. you did, yes, yes. But, but that is not, there's no copy available of it or anything. Or um, well, I did a PhD, it's yeah. a lot in there. I did as a PhD okay. with all the boring details. Okay. <laughs> Some of them were boring <laughs> indeed. <laughs> um, and there was said ants um, was another I, I, one. Yeah. I'm just trying to think if it's actually, oh dear. Um, it was girdle we, we I used as a. As a ah, yes, you're right, yeah. Because yeah. it was far nicer than prologue because it had all the types all nicely. Yes, I agree. Yes, yeah. but I, I mean, there's my there's my um, my PhD which is available. Yeah, yeah, um, I think I have that. Yes, yeah, yeah. I can't remember exactly what else, what I've still got. Um, I would have to log in and find out. Um, but a lot of the code still, the Girdle code is there. Yeah. Um, and I think the Girdle code would be enough. I think there's a whole appendix with Girdle code in. Oh, okay. Matter. It's a long time ago, I've forgotten. <laughs> but anyway, if there's anything you want to know about it, email me and, and ask, and okay, I'll try and dig out the answer. Um, mm. I've got to log in two or three layers of machines to find anything at Huddersfield. Not been into Huddersfield for a couple of years now, or mm. a year and a half since, lot, since the pandemic. Um, and so everything has to be done, you know, I haven't actually got my own copies. I have to log in and find them and bring them across using FTP and stuff. And it's mm. very tiresome. Been doing different things as well since then. 
Um, actually, we've been doing the opposite, which is trying to, um, given a specification or a concept, given examples, trying to alter the specification. Mm -hmm. we, there's been a few stuff, a lot of stuff on that with our traffic control systems, um, with the um, a, a, a separation of two aircraft on particular paths having to be, you know, longitudinal, and lateral or vertical. So we sort of did the opposite for a bit. Anyway. I've had a long life and done lots of bits and pieces, <laughs> mainly dabbling. <laughs> but if you anything you want to know, okay, email you, and ask me, and I'll try and dig it out from somewhere. And if, if I may ask Anthony another question, or <laughs> do, do you know whether uh, Altran Praxis still use Z, or do they still exist, or do they? Uh, well, I, I don't know. Uh, don't I don't know definitely because I haven't we... worked with them for many years. But um, certainly. Um, the, uh, they, they certainly maintain a current system which is specified and as far as I know continues to be specified and they're the big okay. uh, air traffic control tool okay. called IFACTS, yeah, uh, which, okay. which is the last project I worked on. Um, uh, and that, that has a, a, a large Z specification. Uh, but, uh, you know, and, and that's a project where some of the things we, we, you've talked about would have been, you know, absolute godsend, of course. I mean, particularly animations. Yeah. And we did at, at the time. Yes, at the uh, time, yeah. Talk, talk to you and probably talk to other, well, we talked to other people about, about any tools for animating Z, but of course it's actually even more difficult than animating B because if it's, it's less, uh, it, it's less um, constructive aspects and um, there was nothing that was, came anywhere near doing what yeah. was needed. But yeah, at the time, I mean, I think the tool has evolved quite a bit since then, so. Uh, yes, sure, yes, yes, well, yes. It would be nice to try again. <laughs> yes, yes, well, it, it would indeed. <laughs> Yeah, so we have a project with our trial and they uh, still using Z and, uh, and, and Spark data, uh, but they also investigate uh, even be uh, at the moment as well. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments or queries? We're still recording, so I could switch off the recording if anyone wants to ask things that uh, won't get recorded. <laughs> We, we might have to delete and <laughs> Anthony, of course, because we're, we're not allowed to talk. Well, we're not allowed to talk about uh, anything, are we? To do with uh, oh, I okay. it's, oh, it's no, no, it's in the public domain. I fact, so okay. So that, yes, no, that's no, right. I've, I've been keeping no, quiet all these years. So. Well, at least I, I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Anyway, if, I'm it's going wrong, to if it's wrong, I shall apologise rather than ask. Yes, I know. <laughs> I'll, I'll switch off recording now. <laughs>